Hi friends, welcome to Igniting Imagination. I'm your host, Lisa Greenwood, and joining me is my co-host for this season, Owen Ross. Hey, Owen. Hi, Lisa. This season, we are spotlighting our 2023 class of Locke Innovative Leader Award recipients. All four spiritual entrepreneurs exemplify the award's aim to honor innovative leaders who take risks for the sake of the gospel. The thing is, when we think about innovative leadership, we often think that innovation can only really happen outside the local church, you know, on the edge where you can actually take risks. And you may remember a meme that made it around social media a few years ago, and it goes kind of like this. Every pastor wants to change the world, and then they get fired for changing the bulletin. <laughs> Ouch, right? <laughs> so, um, and we laugh because there's truth in humor. It's it's painful, though, and leading from the center of the church certainly comes with its own unique dynamic and challenges. And the thing is, innovation is possible in the center. And I'll take it one step further. Innovation in the center is imperative today. So, Owen, I would love to hear your thoughts on innovating from the center of the church, meaning pastoring local churches or even in annual conferences, and what do you see in your role in church development? I think in a way, innovating from the center today is easier uh, because we're in huh. such a disorienting season that that people are looking for a new way to do things. And so I, I feel like... Uh, we're able to take advantage for those who desire and to say in this season of reorientation and in this uh, and season that some people are characterizing as a desperation by the church, it's really providing a, an environment for us to innovate. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, in other words, the, the um, field is, is ripe, if you will, for innovation, for trying new things in a way that maybe it hasn't been in a long time. Yeah, that, that makes some sense. Yep. So there's yeah. a couple of phrases that I hear you use all the time, Owen, and, and I would love to hear you say more about them. One is you say every church planting, and the other is you talk about new faces and new spaces. So can you say a word yeah. about those and what they mean to you and, and what you mean by them? Yeah, in leading church development in North Texas, our vision is every church planting. And I, I shared that with my evangelism class last week. And they said, well, I belong to this small church. Well, it turns out this student didn't know that this church is looking at planting a new satellite in a different town in a restaurant. <laughs> but because awesome. church planting in, in the student's mind was, you know, buying a buying a six figure piece of property, building a seven figure building on that, on that piece of property that could not wrap the mind that a new church could look like meeting in a, in a restaurant in a neighboring town or meeting in a coffee shop or meeting in a park or, or, and so, um, every church planting, we're going to realize if every church is planting, planting is going to look different in in every church. But, uh, when people stop coming to church, the church has to go to the people and that's what mm -hmm. reaching new faces and new spaces is about. Uh, perfect lead in to our conversation with Michael Ginger. <laughs> so let me tell you about him just a little bit. The Reverend Michael Ginger leads uh, Galveston Central Church, a creative community where radical grace is believed and practiced. Known for his tenacious solidarity with the poor, he partners with organizations to innovate new approaches to address um, those who are unsheltered across the city. He is an elder in the United Methodist Church, having earned an undergraduate degree in religion from Baylor University and a Master of Divinity degree from Perkins School of Theology at Southern Methodist University. So, Owen, what stood out to you from our conversation with Michael? Well, well, first of all, he is just such a, a charismatic, dynamic, hopeful uh, pastor that I, I just left filled. And when he would start talking about bringing uh, people who the world works really hard to keep apart, about bringing them to be together in community, bringing them together in service, I mean, it gave me hope. We, 
you know, in this yeah. divisive season in our nation, divisive season in our, uh, you know, and that divisiveness has even, you know, seeped into the church. And but the way that he is bringing people together and putting them in mm-hmm. service together, putting them in worship together, putting them in small groups together. Well, I, I think I, I truly believe that's the hope for our nation, the hope for our world. And and he's really living that Christ like model in and bringing diverse people together in community. Yeah, may it be so. May it be so. A couple of things that stood out for me just right along with that um, is, you know, every story he told and even the way he talked about how he innovates and gets new ideas and, and does his ministry, all of it has this kind of distributed power, if you will. There is a genuine... Mm, yes come alongsideness, if you will, um, for his ministry, but also how they are the church in their neighborhood with their neighbors. I mean, it, it, it's just something I think that, um, all of us can be inspired by and learn from. And, and then the other thing is just to echo what you have said about how hopeful and, and I mean, you, you all will hear it as you listen, like, it's in his voice. It's in his countenance. He is so filled with a kind of Holy Spirit lightness. It's, it's, I mean, I had chills so many times during this conversation. I can't wait for y'all to, to hear it. So let's listen to our conversation with Michael. So hi, Michael. Thank you for being with us. We're so excited to be in conversation with you today. Well, thanks so much for having me, Lisa. It's great to be here with you and Owen. And uh, yeah, what a gift. Great. So I want to start really with your um, telling us a bit about your journey that led you to Galveston Central Church. Yeah, it's kind of a crazy, uh, wild, winding journey. So um, I'm originally from Connecticut, of all places, and then moved to exotic Lake Charles, Louisiana for a bit, and then settled in uh, the Houston area. And um, after undergrad, I started seminary at Perkins doing their Houston Galveston Extension Program. And uh, while I was working at a kind of church plant in League City, uh, our DS came and said, hey, there's this church in Galveston, been around since 1885, had a membership of close to a thousand in the 1940s and 50s. It's down to about four people um, and we'd love to send you there. And um, if you and your soon to be wife join, like membership increases by 50%, it's like gonna be a really exciting adventure. And so I was young and dumb or, or maybe inspired, I don't know, and, uh, and went down to Galveston. And um, yeah, we uh, kept things going for a little bit. Um, and then after about six months realized this isn't working church as it was just isn't working anymore. And so I actually shut the church down for about six months relaunched in February for 20 in February of 2015 with sort of an eye towards uh, who had been left out by traditional church things. And so, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. yeah, Bishop Huey was responsible for me ending up down there on this kind of wild, but if I think if I would have known more details, I probably would have said no to, but it's been such a gift and a grace, um, in my life. I love how you tell this so, story with such energy and, and you're giving your DS and Bishop at the time, like such grace when you're like, Hey, yeah. And they said such great opportunity. And I'm thinking <laughs> most folks who are sent to a church with four people might not have quite the energy and enthusiasm that you're telling this with. So I've <laughs> learned now that, yeah, opportunity is such a loaded word when it comes from the higher ups that be, right? So this means uh, it's going to be hustle and grind for the next little bit. But um, but yeah, I mean, it's yeah, it's an exciting time. And I, I think there's a lot of parallels to sort of what the church is going through now with like lack of resources and mm-hmm. diminished attendance mm-hmm. and um, produces kind of a, a scrappiness that allows for new and exciting ministries to sort of take place. So as one of the higher ups that, uh, that, that be yes. as a, oh, as a beer crap for Jesus who leads church development for the North Texas conference. Uh, tell me about some of the, the challenges and benefits about stepping into an existing church and then, and then restarting rather than just starting afresh from new, like a, as a parachute. Can you speak about that? How you get, how you got started? Absolutely. Let's start with challenges. 
So you have a, a church that's been in the community and has been known as one particular thing for, I mean, since 1885, right? When I got there, I'd been there for 130 years or so and had the reputation of being very white, very wealthy, a little bit racist, um, which works for some places in the South, but wasn't the vibe we were trying to go for with our kind of new restart. And so you had to kind of battle against some of these cultural realities of what this church had sort of represented in our neighborhood and our community. So there was really a, a, a facelift, kind of a PR almost that had to be different when we were gonna come in and graft ourselves onto that story. The other challenge, um, the four people that were left, saints, right? I mean, just amazing folks that have kept this place going. But if you're somebody who's going to stick around in a church like that, um, when it's gone down to four people and not go to one of the other Methodist churches in Galveston, you're probably a little bit change averse. Um, you probably like things the way that they were. And so amazingly, these folks kind of gave us the keys, blessed us and said, go and try something new. But, but that was a potential challenge for how are these folks that are the stakeholders I'm going to envision something bigger than just what they've had for the last, you know, 130 years. So those are some of the initial challenge. And then, of course, lack of resources. Um, you don't have a base to sort of give money towards. But really opportunity. I mean, there's tremendous freedom, right? There are very few people to say we've always done it this way. So opportunity for new ministries, new ideas. Um, really that time period, the six months that we shut down was a gift because I got to go worship in other places. I got to see what people were doing on Sunday mornings when they weren't in church. There's this great thing called brunch. I don't know if y'all have heard of it, but it's fantastic <laughs> on Sunday mornings. And so highly recommend. Um, so kind of just getting the pulse of the island, um, what was going on when people weren't with us on Sundays. And then another gift was we, we had a space, right? I mean, it was a mess. We have skylights that are not supposed to be there. And um, mm. it can be kind of an albatross mm. to keep up with sometimes. But we had a we had a place um, that we could call people to, that we could do things in, that could really be transformed to serve the community. So, yeah, both blessing and challenge all kind of wrapped up in there, Owen. Ah, thanks for sharing that. You said this um, interesting thing that caught my ear. Uh, when you talked about you closed for six months and then when you re reopened, you reopened with an eye for who you hadn't been in ministry with. And, and that's, a, that's a real shift there from, I think for, for most of us who wanna reopen and, and maybe uh, do a better job of what hadn't been done, but you actually opened with a different set of eyes and um, priorities. And so will you talk about that a little bit? Did I hear that right? Yes. That's exactly right, Lisa. So we, um, you know, there was a real discernment period during that time of, does there need to be a Galveston Central Church? Or would it be better for us to partner with Moody Methodist or St. Paul United Methodist Church and help them do what they do more fully better? But kind of as we surveyed the island, we realized there were these distinct populations um, mm. that mm. church wasn't working for, that they weren't having their needs met. And so um, it became this kind of flip of um, if we're going to be relevant and we're not going to try to duplicate what's already being done, we need to be listening, right? So for us, those populations were um, our unsheltered, our homeless friends in Galveston. Um, we do a lot of work with undocumented persons um, around immigration. So during COVID, we had about 300 undocumented families that we were connected with, helping to make sure that um, many of those frontline workers were losing jobs, we're losing money, and so helping to connect them to resources. Um, LGBTQ inclusion has been a really important part of our work here. And then working around um, racial reconciliation. So kind of seeing those groups of people and the folks that wanted to be in solidarity with those folks as well, that was kind of the, the wide net that we cast at the beginning. Um, yeah, it was great. And and, and one of the strategies that many of the developers are using are moving into a multi-site. And so you had some obvious partners that you could have become a site of, um, but you you chose, you know, independence and, and, and spoke a little bit about that. But yet partnership has also been at the, the center of your ministry. Can you talk about that, that dance about about, you know, having your own identity, being your own your own self, but yet having a high value of partnership and developing those partnerships? That's a great question. Oh, and so 
Yeah, it was really important for me at the beginning as sort of the, the like chief vision caster. That was kind of my role at the beginning, right? Working with my board, my launch team, but but really my role was to say, who is this church going to be and what are we going to value? And so for that, independence was really important so we could get crystal clear on who we wanted to serve, um, who we were going to be working with, what sort of things we held um, value. So um, so that was important at the beginning, but I also recognized early on, and my team did as well, like, <laughs> I think some of our church planners think their job is to like bring Jesus to the community, right? We're going to bring God and we're going to offer this as sort of a product to our people instead of having the vision to see, oh, God is already at work in my community. And so how can I strategically partner with these organizations that are already doing wonderful things? So we've got a medical school on the island and we've got a branch of Texas A&M. We've got farmers markets and we've got incredible nonprofit agencies and faith communities. And so it just became a very obvious thing that with our little teeny tiny church with four plus me and my wife, we were never going to be able to do these sort of big things that God had in store for this little church unless we chose to partner with other organizations um, and utilize their gifts and graces. And our name didn't need to be on everything. It didn't have to be central, whatever. It was just for the benefit of our community. If it was for Galveston, then we wanted to sign up for that. Mm, nice. I love that. Um, in some ways, you're already answering this question that I have in my mind, but um, but I'm, I wanna push you on a little bit. And that is, you know, uh, you've been named an innovative leader and I know that that is a name now that has been placed on you that you may or may not claim for yourself. But, um, but I and, and we all think you're incredibly innovative and it makes all the difference. And so I'm curious about what you see that is innovative about your approach to ministry. Yeah, I think there's a couple things. Um, one of, I think, our, our spaces of innovation is, so this is the first church that I've ever served where the people that we are serving, right, actually show up on Sunday mornings for worship. Every other community I've been a part of, um, folks would come in, they'd receive whatever they needed, and then they would go worship somewhere else. And I think what Central has done really well um, is mm -hmm. fostering friendships. Our, our friend Matt Russell, right, talks about improbable friendships all the time. And really that's what's happening here is we're trying to get out of a sort of transactional model, um, a social service model that's based on hierarchies of the haves and the have nots. And so what does that do to someone's psyche, their dignity? And if you're made to feel less than unintentionally often by well-meaning nonprofit religious organizations, you're probably not gonna show up and be in community with those same folks when it comes to meeting your spiritual needs. We've been really intentional about flattening those power dynamics, finding creative ways, and not just giving lip service to, but really um, creating grassroots power um, that comes sort of from the bottom up. So, you know, a great example of this, we have a, a monthly community meeting where we're listening to our folks because I, um, I have no experience with homelessness. And so for me to sort of prescribe, this is what you need is ridiculous, right? So we have to have these listening sessions where we can hear what folks, what are we missing? What are we doing well? What needs to be done better? And early on, our, our folks said, you know, Michael, when we're trying to get to work or when we're trying to get to our social services, we're walking or we're on bicycle and our bikes keep breaking down, we get a flat tire, um, chain falls off. So we need a place to fix our bicycles. So we said, oh, well, that's interesting. And so made some calls and got people connected. And we have a, a bicycle repair shop on campus now that uh, partners with a, a local bike organization that gives us parts for free or at cost. But that entire thing is run by people living on the streets, right? We have some folks from our community that, that oversee it, but it really is this ownership piece by people that this is theirs and they get to kind of set the tone and what happens there. And so I think that, that um, that's sort of addressing those power dynamics, I think is kind of innovative and figuring out how do we do life together? Our kitchen, you know, when you walk in, we feed hundreds of people every week, but, but I don't think you can tell when you're in the kitchen, who's somebody who was sleeping on the beach last night, who's a UTMB student, who's a congregant that showed up. It's just this wonderful mix of people that are all serving together. 
that are learning from each other and are starting with what's right with you rather than what's wrong with you. Right? We're not trying to fix people. We're just trying to have this tenacious solidarity with each other um, and seeing what God does with those kinds of relationships. So I think that's been really innovative. You know, as well as being a, you know, a social service center or a spiritual service center or, you know, holistic ministry is what, you know, Jesus did is what John Wesley did. Um, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm interested on kind of uh, how, ha what has been the result in, in what you would call the worshiping congregation of, of central, not necessarily membership, but that which has become the worshiping congregation, you know, um, those who may have come through the door of a social service, have they come into the uh, spiritual services? Those who come in the door of the spiritual services end up in the social service as, as you know, as servants or, or recipients or both. Um, can you speak a little bit about that dynamic? Because, and, and the reason I share this, and I, you know, there's, you know, a famous quote talked about the great divorce between social services and religious services. And it seems like you've, you've captured the, the uniting of those uh, in a way that is reflective of our Lord. Yeah, I, wanna, I think that's, I think you're right to take that back to Jesus, right? Like I, I think Jesus, like people showed up because Jesus was probably a pretty good preacher, but also everywhere that Jesus was preaching, there was like food, right? There was bread, there was fish. And so these things seem to be like deeply intertwined with each other. I don't think that's a, a, an accident. And of course, Wesley with his work, um, with the foundry and with other places, they were always like really closely linked together. And we've seen the same sort of thing at Central. One of our, our values is care for the whole person. And so we want to take a look and say like your spiritual life is your actual life. And so we need to address you holistically, just like you were saying. And so people would ask initially what your church like why do you have a clinic and it's like because we're called to care for whole people and and it's hard i think to follow jesus to live the full life that god's called us to if you're don't have access to medical care right i mean that's a really hard or if you don't have access to food or whatever that may be so we're trying to link those things together there was a book and i can't remember the author but it was called the great giveaway and it traces how religious institutions have kind of punted the work of social service to the nonprofit sector and how that kind of rose. And I'm so thankful for our nonprofit brothers and sisters and kin who are doing that kind of work because the church hasn't in a lot of spaces. But my board just kind of got together and said, why do the nonprofits get to have all the fun, right? We want to be involved in this kind of life changing work and not start something that we're going to spin off that then is no longer connected to the church. But we've been really intentional about holding all of that in the work of Central under our same 501c3. So this is all deeply connected together. So for folks coming in the door, I have, I mean, probably 20% of our congregation wouldn't be able to, or would choose not to articulate some kind of like theistic belief, right? Because of past church trauma, because of their own wrestling and deconstruction, but they're so curious about what's happening in this space and they want to be a part of whatever this thing is. And so I think our social service work gives people a way to enter into religious communities without having to like first go through this creed or believe these 10 things, right? Um, the Protestant movement has often been like, believe, behave, and then you can belong, right? And so central, mm -hmm. and a lot of the people working with TMF want to flip that upside down and say, no, first just come belong, come be a part of what mm -hmm. we're doing, and then maybe try some of the practices that we're doing, try to, to love the poor and be in small groups with each other. And then maybe belief might come along sometime afterwards where this stuff kind of enters into your heart. So that's been folks coming in. Lots of our people that come in for social services worship with us on Sunday. It's kind of the wild west of churches. You never know what you're going to get on a Sunday morning, which is a blast. And then the opposite's been true, too. So one of my favorite stories is one of our congregants moved down from a very wealthy neighborhood in the Dallas area. And um, they moved to Galveston close to one of the parks where a lot of our unsheltered friends hang out. And um, they were walking through the park one evening and noticed all these people hanging out at the park and made a mental note that they probably needed to let the police know that folks were there up to surely like nefarious activities, right? And so as they're making their way out of the park, they hear somebody yell and they call out these couples, their, their first names, calls them over. And it's one of our friends from our community who lives in that park and invites them over to the picnic table that he was sitting at by name and says, we met at church and they sat down and they start having this conversation. They end up staying for about two hours talking mm. to this guy. 
and then they leave oh my God. and they never call the cops that night. And I think this is what's happening at Central, right? We're remembering, like Mother Teresa said, you can diagnose all the world's problems by this. We've forgotten that we belong to each other. So Central's this place of remembering, deep belonging, I think. Yeah. And I, you spoke earlier about the hierarchy and trying to undo the hierarchy and how many of our social services just reiterate uh, that hierarchy. I, I got exposed to this in 2000 when I was a student at Africa University with a quote from Stephen Biko, which is basically paraphrase. I'm paraphrasing to say if everything in the world communicates to you that you're inferior, you have inferior income, inferior transportation, if everything in the world tells you you're inferior, how in the world are you supposed to look at the world and say that's a lie? And Biko says, without a transformation of consciousness, it's not possible. And I just think, you know, the gospel is is such a transforming uh, power. And part of the gospel is calling out the lies of the world in order to communicate the truth. And I just, uh, you know, you did that for that couple that moved down from the Dallas area and that they, they just. And that's the beauty. They, they, oh, and I think is like this is on both sides of the demographic divide. Right. So there was, there yeah. was one Sunday. I'll never forget this. One of our folks who had been living outside came in, was able to shower, got a hot meal before service started. She said, Michael, you know, this place makes me feel human again, is what she mm. said. So this reclaiming yeah, of humanity. Yeah, yeah. Same Sunday, one of our most wealthy members wrote us a fairly substantial check to be able to do some work in the community, divesting of too much stuff that they had accumulated, which I think is a spiritual issue. And he said, Michael, this place makes me feel human again. It was mm. the same phrase that happened on people radically different ends of the socioeconomic spectrum, but because they found this place to, to again, uh, be seen, to see others, to be in relationship with each other, this deep humanizing happened. And so this mm. kind of, you know, mm. movement towards each other. Um, yeah, it's, just, it's, it's wonderful. I've got the best job in the world. So it's a gift <laughs> to get to watch this happen. In I love to hear you talk about this. I love it. And, and I can't tell you how many times in the last few minutes I've just had chills as you tell these stories. It's, it's beautiful. And um, uh, so I, I'm really curious, Michael, where you have experienced pushback or resistance. Yeah. Uh, f yes, everywhere, all the time. So, um, you know, we are, yeah, in some ways, like the denomination isn't always sure what to do with us, right? Mm. So um, we meet a lot of the metrics of a typical new church start, um, but then we're doing some weird stuff. And so um, that's an interesting- You mean there aren't boxes on the forms for those things? <laughs> I may get in trouble for confessing this and, um, Oh, and since you work in your conference office, plug your ears. But like this year, I refuse to turn in my year-end reports because I think we're measuring stupid things. And so uh, a church like Central, that uh, like worship attendance is not a metric for us that makes any sort of sense. Like it's one indicator, but it's not any kind of financial for folks that are, you know, hiding on their food stamps. Like this is not the same kind of indicator of what's going on and doesn't tell the story and it's not something I'm interested in trying to uh, match because I think we we the metrics that we value are, is indicative of the work that we do, right? So I want to find new metrics to be able to think about central and how we're doing things there. So denominational pushback, as you can imagine, um, our, our neighbors don't always know what to do with us, mm -hmm. and so we're in the mm -hmm. middle of a, a residential neighborhood. And so uh, probably two years ago, one of our neighbors came and knocked on the door and said, you know, this used to be a really nice church. They only did things on Sunday mornings. <laughs> and my admin just reading uh, Greg Boyle's book said, you know, some of us think it's it's finally a church for the first time. And so um, it's easy to kind of get defensive. And then I have to pause and breathe and remember that I wasn't always in this place. And this is new and radical for a lot of folks. And so you know, really seeing my role is to help people come along and understand just a different way of being in the world. And I'm just convinced when people are met with that kind of love, when they get to see their neighbor up close, mm -hmm. that's really where transformation happens. And so these are all opportunities to get to walk alongside folks and invite them in, right? Um, we never kick anybody out. It's just come be a part of this if you want to. Well, Michael, you mentioned finances and, you know, you know, I was 15 minute, 15 years ministry with low income, undocumented, unauthorized immigrants that we had here in Dallas and funding the ministry every year was a challenge. 
now that I work in church development, we're wanting to plant lots of churches and, and reach, you know, lower wealth areas. Um, how do you fund this? Uh, with a prayer, Owen, is a lot of it. So now there's a little more strategy to that, but it's, um, I really appreciate you saying that, though, because I do think one of the sins of some of our UMC conferences right now has been our way of planting churches in the past, which has been white, middle class, sustainable communities. And and I think like I hear you saying and like we're talking about here, poor communities deserve quality pastors and churches that are doing like life giving, thriving kind of ministry. So we have to be creative with how we're thinking about funding. So um we have a lot of little givers at Central, which ends up adding up to quite a bit. So that's one source of, of revenue for us. We have a lot of folks that give money to Central that have never stepped foot in our building. Um, the local coffee shop that I office out of, the owner, um, just wrote us a check a few months ago. She's never been to Central, but she hears about what we're doing and is interested in that and wants to support that work in the community. So that's been a gift. Certainly a lot of grant writing and finding creative um, avenues that way. But we're starting to try to think about some entrepreneurial endeavors to be able to be um, revenue drivers. So um, Mike Bachman uh, at Union had this great image where he said, you know, uh, he thought of Union like a bicycle, right? And so the coffee shop, kind of the, the spiritual life, Caneo, all these things was the, the front wheel of the bicycle sort of guiding vision, where's it heading? But that back wheel just has to keep churning to keep it propelling. And so for them, that was the, the coffee sales. So we're trying to discern for us, what is our version of sort of the coffee sales, whether that's a, a restaurant or um, some art initiatives from our community. So I think churches are going to have to figure this out because I think the day of the offering plate um, is quickly coming to an end. And so if we want to do this sort of sustainable ministry, it's creative partnerships, it's grant writing, and then probably finding some for-profit ways of um, putting money back into the machine. I think also something I've learned from our um, other lock leaders is um, we tend to think of capital in a very narrow sense too. And so reframing, especially for funders and when you're applying for grants, the social and relational capital that's happening at Central, the different partnerships. I mean, I, we pay zero dollars for our clinic upstairs, which is insane. So I, I've been trying to do the math of like, what would that cost? And how do we show funders um, this is like a, I don't know, $2 million a year endeavor that we're paying $0 for that's essentially being donated that we need to count as uh, value, right? Capital value, philanthropic value, and see some matching things that way. Um, again, our sustainability conversations tend to only be around dollars. And I want us to think beyond that and folks to see, look, Central is able to provide all of these other networks, connections, um, gifts and graces of our people we just don't have the dollars, right? And so hopefully then philanthropy can come alongside and, and begin to match that way. Yeah, fabulous. I love that. And and one of the things that I'm noticing as you um, talk about your ministry and there, there are all these creative ways of being the church that have emerged, that you've had eyes to see and partners to collaborate with and, and such. I'm really curious what expands your imagination? Like, what are the ways that you move out beyond your own background, upbringing experiences to expand your imagination for the next thing or the next potential possibility? Yeah, I, so I find inspiration in, in stories. Like, I, I feel like hmm. my stuff, like I'm pastor, but then like the subtitle is like chief story collector, I guess, is kind of how I see that. And so in, in nice. being with people from our community, like deep listening, um, finding ways to frame the story. So starting with the stories that we're experiencing out in the community and then seeing their resonance with like the biblical narrative instead of the other way around, which is how a lot of, I think, clergy persons do that. Um, that's opened up just a, a treasure trove of sort of possibilities God-sized dreams, innovations um, that way. And so, you know, we've been talking a lot about relationship and kinship. When, when you fall in love with a group of people, um, 
you do anything for them. And so, uh, you know, the mm -hmm. solidarity that's happened at Central with these folks means we have to find creative ways to meet these larger than life sorts of needs, problems, issues that are happening in our community. Um, and then that imagination means looking in unexpected places and faces for the solutions, being able to think outside the box with some of this. So one of the projects we're working on right now is a, is a housing project. We bought a, um, a med school dorm. I found out it was actually a, a frat house for some of the med students, which is just a fantastic story. And we're flipping that and going to turn it into um, uh, sustainable uh, transitional housing for our folks with kind of all the wraparound services involved. But that really came about because in 2021, we had our charge conference where we were reading off the names of people that had died the previous year. Mm -hmm. And every name that we read off that year was somebody who died either as a result of their poverty, substance abuse, or they took their own life. Yeah. And it was devastating. Um, one of those was my friend David, who was um, six foot three, um, had major health issues because he had health issues. He couldn't get a job because he couldn't get a job. He couldn't get insurance. He couldn't get insurance. Major health issues because he had major health issues. He couldn't get. So it was this whole circle of things. Wow. He died from very preventable things. And so um, hmm. at that moment, our staff kind of um, cried and raged and um, just decided we we can't wait for sort of these larger um, city initiatives. Like we just need to start doing things because I'm not willing to let any more of my friends die. Again, relationship and kinship. And so that's where now what's going to be David's house, right? This place that's going to allow people to transition nice. out of homelessness. Um, those kinds of yeah relationships and, and uh, hearing needs, deep listening is being, um, yeah, put into like a, I don't know, it's the fuel for uh, for the exciting work that we're doing, I think. So just just yeah, being in relationship with folks. Mm -hmm. And I love mm -hmm. music is a huge source of inspiration for me, too. I love music and poetry. Um, we were really involved with some poets here on the island. And so so much of our work is the theological. And so um, what does the, the theopoetical sort of look like? And finding these different ways of thinking about the divine, God's work in the community. Yeah, poets are amazing at uh, translating something into a totally different way of experiencing that. That's often more full-bodied than just our our brains. And so, what does it mean for the church to kind of adopt that same posture? Rethink our containers, like sermons and um, hymns and these things, and and reshape those to be something new for folks. So, I, I mean. Beautiful. I know also that uh, that you're thinking about things in a systemic way as well. I mean, to you know, you provide food for the homeless. Uh, you know, you get called a saint, and you start meddling around asking why do we have all these homeless and how do we change that? Then you know, stay in your lane, pastor. Uh, <laughs> and so, how how are you approaching the systemic? Uh, I mean, which becomes political, how do you address that systemic and political uh, issue of, you know, caring for the poor in your, uh, there in Galveston and beyond? Yeah, so one of the transformational things for me in my ministry was realizing how political Jesus is, right? They're not partisan, that's a different thing, but Jesus was concerned about how our life was organized and, and how, what does it mean? What does the common good mean? How do we interact with each other, which is inherently political? And so, you know, I, I think it's the invitation of every Christian to sort of look under the rug and behind the corners and um, in the back rooms to be able to see why are things arranged the way that they are, to ask really critical questions about who benefits from this. Um, not that I've counted, but there's roughly 2,103 verses in the Bible about the poor and the oppressed crying out to God, right, for things to be different. And so, again, I, I think if we're going to be in solidarity with the divine, if we're going to have that relationship, it means a solidarity with the poorest among us, because this seems to be where God shows up, which means that then we have to begin to examine these sort of larger systems. And so, you know, we've done some of this work in Galveston. COVID was a big time when we were doing a lot of advocacy stuff, asking questions about access. Uh, language justice was a big thing during COVID. Everything was in English, and Galveston has a high percentage of Spanish speakers. So um, some folks from our church helped to get things translated like um, it needed to be so folks could access vaccine information. We just had some of our um, 
it was a social worker and two nurses from our clinic that um, the the Social Security Administration office is about 30 minutes north of here. And you have to go across the causeway, the bridge that links the mainland to the island, which is illegal to walk across. So if you don't have transportation, oh, wow. you can't oh, get wow. up there. So <laughs> the three of them called the bus service. They, of course, got three different answers about where the bus picks up, when it drops off. They had to figure out how to get the five dollars it costs to get up there on the bus. They had to figure out the transfer and then finally made it to the Social Security Administration about two and a half hours later and then had to wait an untold amount of time and then do the whole trip back. So they filmed the whole thing. And, um, you know, we've gotten a audience with our congressional representative and are trying to think about bringing a Social Security satellite office here to the island that would be open a day or two um, a month where folks could access that and not have to figure out how to get across the causeway. So again, these all come from relationships and listening to people and trying to affect um, larger change in our community. Nice. Fabulous. And I, uh, I know you could just tell story after story and I'm loving this because in yeah. your <laughs> deep listening and in your, um, very real uh, flattening of the power structure. Like the church gets to be the church because you're listening to where the needs of people are, but also their assets, their what they contribute to the whole. Like it, it's this beautiful picture of what it means to be the church. This is, it's just fabulous, Michael. I thank you for doing this with us and, and, uh, we, we are asking all our guests a final question. So are you ready? Did you have something else you were going to say? No, I, this is great, Lisa. Yeah. No. Okay. Okay, great. So, um, so we're asking all our guests this final question, which is, what is a breath of fresh air in the church today that you're seeing that is nothing less than the gift of the Spirit? That's a good question. I, I was thinking about this, and there's so many different answers to pull from. Um, but I, I really think so coming off of the COVID-19 pandemic and all of the racial unrest that we experienced in 2020 and, and to the present and obviously before that, too, um, and then our own like disaffiliation division in the United Methodist Church, like it's just been an imagination suck for the last like three years. I mean, it's I felt the least creative I've ever been during this time period. And yet, finally, it's almost like that that little bud at springtime when you start to see like the greenery coming back. Mm -hmm. I'm starting to notice in my own life, in my community at Central, and really the church broadly, uh, this amazing life that's coming back. And it's mm -hmm. different than it was before. It's... Um, you know, if we've got the fruits of the spirit, maybe maybe the tenth fruit is the the fruit of scrappiness, right? Which is these churches that have lost membership, they've lost finances, they're smaller than they were before, and they're finding really creative, innovative ways to partner with other community organizations, to partner with um, stakeholders, persons of peace in their community, to find ways to do really big ministry um, with really small budgets and resources. And I think there's this general sense of um, vision changing from a, a scarcity mindset to a mindset of abundance within people, within opportunities, even as all of these like studies and demographic data are suggesting that um, we're in a world of hurt. I just think it's a really exciting time for what's happening next. And so, you know, I, I'm more hopeful than I think I've ever been. That's a word that I use like really rarely because um, I think it gets abused, especially in the populations that I serve quite a bit. Um, but of course, in, in Spanish, right, hope is the word esperanza, which is linked to our word desperate, desperation. And so there almost seems to be this really wonderful, beautiful sense of we've got to figure something out different or else we're going to be dead, right? And and so this desperation linked to this hope, I think, is is just creating all sorts of exciting possibilities innovation. That's got me really excited right now. I love it. Excited about desperation and scrappiness and hope and possibility. So good. Thank you for being with us today, Michael. Mm -hmm.